So you're all ready for some word of God in Swedish accent? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, you know, before we go into the actual word of God, I want to start out with telling you a story here today. And I want to rewind with you uh, like 380 years so that we end up in the year 1642 in a small village called Witham in the county of Lincolnshire in England where a young boy is born. And he was born in this house. Now, life could not have started any worse, really, for this young kid. When he was born, his father had already passed away, leaving his mother at only 19 years old with a house but with debts and completely unable to support for her new young family. And on top of that, the boy was born prematurely. And nowadays, that's not such a big deal normally. But this was, again, 380 years ago. And being born too early left this boy sick and, and weak for many, many years. And on top of that, when the boy was only three years old, a priest came from the neighborhood village and proposed to his young mother. Now, the mother was only 22 at the time, and the priest was almost 70. Yeah. But the priest said, if you marry me, you can just move into my vicarage and, and you will never have to worry about money or, or, or food or clothes ever again. There was just one condition. She was not allowed to bring the boy because the priest hated that three-year-old boy. And the mother, for some reason, accepts his proposal. She marries him. She moves in with him in his vicarage, and she hands the child over to her parents to be raised by them. And you know, when you're three years old, you don't know a lot, but you know if you're rejected. Yeah. And later on, when this boy became a man and he would write his memoirs, it's a heartbreaking read to, to read how he would walk over to the other village at the age of four, five, and six. And he would sit upon a hill overlooking the village and he would see the vicarage where his mother is now living with this new man and he would just sit there and hate for hours and hours. He would hate her for leaving him. He would hate the priest for taking her away from him. And he would hate the God that that priest represented. And as the years went by, of course, as hate always does, it just grew inside of him. So when he started school, he was an angry child. He would talk back to the teacher and get punished for it. He would bully his fellow students. He would not learn. And every time as the year came to a close and, and he was given his grades, they always said the same three words. Lazy, will not learn, good for nothing. Lazy will not learn good for nothing. That's stamped constantly on his soul and on his future. Until the day, because everybody knew there was going to be a turning point to this story, right? <laughs> Until the day a new teacher arrives in the village of Witham. Now, history doesn't tell us a lot about this teacher, apart from the fact that his name was John Houston, and then he was a devout Christian and a man of prayer. And for some reason... John Houston's eyes fell on this little angry boy. And he made a commitment inside his heart that, that there's beauty inside that dark heart somewhere. And I'm going to find that beauty and I'm going to bring it out. And even though he would have had such a more easy time tutoring and caring for any other student, he chose that little boy. And he loved him. And he prayed for him. And he taught him. And he listened to him, and he talked to him, and gradually, as the weeks turned into months and years, this little dark heart started opening up, step by step. And as it did, John Houston was, was, was uh, surprised to find that this boy is intelligent. This boy has got great academic potential. It's just not been unleashed yet. And he made advanced calculations, and he excelled, especially in the areas of math and physics and astronomy. And when this young boy became a young man, and it was time for him to go to university, John Houston paid for his studies himself so that he can go to Cambridge University. And when he arrived in this brand new academic setting, he started to flourish. 
And within a year, he was the talk of the university. Within two years, he was the talk of the city. And just a few years down the road, he was the talk of the whole world. Because I'm talking about a man who we know as Sir Isaac Newton, one of the greatest minds of the history of science. And when I stumbled across this story, it was at a visit actually at Westminster Abbey in London, where he's buried. And I, I stumbled upon it because I read the epitaph, the inscription on his grave, and it actually said this. I still remember it. Here lies Sir Isaac Newton, a man with an intellect close to the divine. They knew their way with words back then. And then he went on to say, mortals rejoice that such an ornament of humanity existed. And I thought to myself when reading that, one man, two different verdicts. One over here is saying lazy, will not learn, good for nothing. Another one over here saying an intellect close to the divine. And I ask myself, what was the turning point? What had this verdict finally come to a close and die? And what gave birth to what would be his end verdict? I'll tell you, right in the middle was one man called John Euston. A man who chose to see the things that were not seen by human eye. A man who chose to believe that nothing and no one is impossible for God. And a man who chose to accept the calling to be a spiritual parent. Because church today, it's all about this. It's about the calling to become a spiritual parent. Amen? Now, we need to understand, every single one of us being in the family of God, that we have different callings. You have one calling that is individual to you. There's one main reason why God put you on this earth and why he allowed you to to be born and raised around here and part of this church. But adding to that calling is another calling that is the same for all of us. And it's the calling to be a spiritual parent for the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes regardless of whether you have physical children or not. God calls us and he trusts us with doing whatever we can to provide the next generation with an atmosphere of faith so that whatever seed God planted inside their hearts will bloom and flourish in their time. Amen? And in order for us to understand this, we need to understand the nature of God. And I remember, and I'm sure you do as well, that earlier this year, Pastor Jonathan taught us a series about the names of God. And he underlined time and time again that God reveals his character and his nature through his names all throughout the Bible and especially the Old Testament. So let's just look at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 15. And we look into one of these names. Exodus 3 and verse 15. This is God speaking to Moses saying, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. So God is quite serious about this name. This is not just my name now. It's a forever name. And from generation to generation, I will be called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, of course, the statement that God wants to make is not just to say, I am the God of these three guys and no one else. The statement he wants to make is this, I am the God of generations. You are an individual and that's fine, but you alone cannot reflect the fullness of the nature of God. We can only do that together when generations connect and stand side by side by side. And if God is the God of generations, that means that his kingdom is a kingdom of generations. And that means that his church needs to be a church of generations. Not by one generation replacing the others, but by all generations coexisting, loving each other, praying for one another, and doing whatever we can to see the kingdom of God uh, expressed and built and launched 
in every single generation. Can we give God a shout of praise here in church today? He is the God of generations, and his kingdom is the kingdom of generations. And that kingdom, my friend, is not supposed to go up and down like a roller coaster. You know, we, we live close to the, what's it called, the Blue Bayo, the Water Park, blah, blah, blah. Can't even pronounce stuff over here yet. I'm getting there. But every single day I drive past this big amusement park and see the roller coasters. I see things going up and down and things going like that. I said, that's the history of the church. So many times. There's been one generation movements and one generation revivals and one generation this and one generation that. And I praise God for every single one of the movements, but I do think there's a better way. I do think that God's intention is for whatever he starts to go from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. Amen. But that will not happen automatically. That demands for you and I to accept the calling to be spiritual parents, not just to live out our individual calling. And you know, we live in the most individualistic time in human history. And even though we're not of this world, we are in this world. And it's easy for us to be infected by that perspective also in our relationship with God. So all we talk about is my calling and my this and my that. It's like the me, myself, and I message, the unholy trinity. But God is another, God's nature is different. Of course, there is an individualistic element to Christianity. You need to get saved out of a personal decision, amen? Nobody can do that for you. You need to get baptized as a personal decision. But once you're saved and baptized, praise God, you are included in the family of generations. And we're not instructed by Christ to pray the prayer, my Father who art in heaven, but our Father. We're part of something bigger, a family of generations in which we need to find our place. So how do you respond to the calling to be a spiritual father? I'm glad you asked. Number one, accept the calling. A lot of Christians don't even get past that point. Accept the calling. Accept the fact that God has entrusted you with a personal individual calling, but also with a shared responsibility to do whatever you can to provide the next generation with an atmosphere of faith. And we see this all throughout the biblical history. We see it in the examples of Moses and Joshua, for example, Exodus chapter 33. And man, as a pastor, I feel for Moses. Because he was the call to be the pastor of the worst church in human history. Just this ungrateful bunch of people. And there were like two or three million of them. And God performs these amazing miracles. He opens the Red Sea. And the people of Israel go, yeah, but we had garlic in Egypt, you know. <laughs> garlic. Garlic back then. I, just, <laughs> I can just think that. You know, after having had a full day of working with this ungrateful bunch of people and striving to keep them happy and counseling them and doing all kinds of things, he must have been starving for the presence of God at the end of the day. He must have longed to go into that tabernacle all alone and just enjoy the presence of God. But still, he was so eager to also live out the calling of a spiritual parent that he didn't go in there alone. He brought young Joshua. And Joshua at the time, most scholars think that he would have been 15 or 16 years old. So a pastor of two to three million people takes the time to introduce a 15, 16 year old to the presence of God. And in here, he tells Joshua, this is what the presence of God looks like. This is what it feels when God is here. This is how you position yourself, Joshua. This is how you worship. And it says at the end of this chapter that when Moses left the tabernacle, Joshua stayed. And somewhere in the presence of God inside that tabernacle, the next generation leader was born inside the heart of a 15-year-old boy. But that would never have happened unless Moses had added to his calling of being the pastor for this group of people also to be a spiritual parent for the next generation. Amen? 
We see that happening again in 1 Samuel chapter 3, the story of Samuel and Eli. Where young Samuel, he grew up in the temple. His mother Hannah handed him over to be raised in the temple, pretty much like some Bethany kids. <laughs> when they're born, they already know all the Bethany worship songs. Because they've been in there for nine months listening to them, Sunday after Sunday. And then there's B Tots, and then there's B Kids, and there's the Christian school, which is the greatest way of growing up. That's, that's the upbringing that Samuel had. But then a day came where God called out his name in a personal way. And it was time for young Samuel to get to know the God that he's heard about and learned about in a personal way. But still, when God calls out his name, he's confused. Who, who is this g voice? W what is this voice? And he goes over to Eli, his spiritual father. Did you call? And Eli doesn't connect what is going on. So he sends Samuel back a couple of times. But then he realizes, oh, it's God. And he sits down with this spiritual son of his. And he says, okay, next time he calls you, this is how you respond. This is what you say. This is what you do. And Samuel, now instructed by a spiritual father, goes back and wait. And when God calls his name again, he knows what to do. He knows what to say. He knows how to position himself. And there, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament is born inside the heart of this young boy. Which would never have happened, though, unless Eli had added to his calling of being a priest, also the calling to be a spiritual parent. Amen? Amen. And of course, then Samuel grows up, and he, he has the same relationship with David. For Samuel chapter 16, God speaks to him that one of the sons of Esai will be the next king. And Samuel, as a grown man now, as a prophet, arrives in this house, and, and the father had lined up all the sons apart from David. Talk about rejection. You know that one of this, his sons will be the next king. And he doesn't even bother to bring him to the American Idol audition. <laughs> Only slightly more important. But Samuel sees with the eyes of a spiritual father. And he brings David in. And he anoints this young man to be the next king. But he doesn't even leave it there. He walks with David throughout his life. He prays for him. He coaches him. He encourages him. And he will be that support of a spiritual father for the next generation. And it goes on and on. We have Elijah and Elisha and so many other examples of how people throughout the Old Testament lived out their individual calling. But also added to that the common responsibility of being a spiritual parent for the next generation. So first of all, just realize this is included in being a Christian. And please don't think that I'm talking to everybody who is my age and older, like really old people. I'm talking to everyone who is 20 years old and above in this room. If you're 20 years or, young, or, or older, you should already be looking behind your back to see, is there anyone younger than me that I can encourage? Is there anyone younger than me that I can pray for? Is there anyone younger than me that I can surround with an atmosphere of faith? Back home in Word of Life in Sweden, I tell our worship leaders, you cannot even call yourself a worship leader in our church unless you train worship leaders that are half your age. You cannot even call yourself a businessman in my church unless you train younger businessmen that is half your age. Because one part of our calling is to live out whatever God has asked us to do. But the second part is to make sure that we give whatever we can give to the next generation so that the kingdom will thrive and grow even stronger in their time. Amen. Bethany Church, I have a secret dream. And that's when it's time for me to go. And I've, I've hopefully, by the grace of God, been obedient to the heavenly calling. And I'm just about to draw my last breath here on earth and be taken into heaven. The last thing I want to see spiritually is the back of the next generation. Passing by the place where I stopped to go on and build greater churches than I ever built. And see greater miracles than I ever saw. And see greater outpourings of the Spirit than I ever did. And reach more people with the gospel than I ever reached. 
But that will not happen automatically. It will happen when we accept the calling to be spiritual parents for the next generation. Number two, develop eyes of faith. And here's where we reconnect to John Houston, the man, the teacher, who saw something in young Isaac Newton that couldn't be seen with the physical eye. Your greatest contribution to the next generation is just to provide them with an atmosphere of faith, prayer, and encouragement. And you know, sometimes God will surprise us. Maybe you have a kid back home that is rebellious and don't want to walk with God. Don't count them out. God can do anything through anyone. Amen? And as long as there's a church that accepts the calling to be a spiritual parental church and keeps praying for the next generation, God has got the material he needs to turn even the most stubborn person into a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? Why is it so important that we develop eyes of faith? Because the next generation is a mustard seed generation. If you have your Bible, would you go to Mark chapter 4? <coughs> and we, we have this well-known story, the parable of Jesus talking about the kingdom of God. Mark 4, 31, it says, it's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when planted... It grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. I know he's not technically talking about teenagers here, but he is so talking about teenagers here. And I'm just magnetically drawn to this side of the stage because I see a lot of young people over there. That's just how my, work, how my heart works. You know what? The young generation is like a mustard seed. If you look at it externally, you don't see its greatness. But inside that mustard seed is a potential that we can, you and I can only imagine. Yeah. But there is one thing expressed in three small words in this verse that needs to happen in order for that explosive power installed in the insignificant seed to come alive. Yet when planted. Yet when planted. The seeds that are just lying there in the bag will be of no good use. But if the seeds are planted, yet when planted, that's when the transformation will start happening. And Bethany, this is going to be very deep now, so take a deep breath, okay? We're going into uncharted theological territory. Seeds don't plant themselves. Do you feel that? Seeds don't plant themselves. Amen. There needs to be a sower involved. There needs to be someone who sees the potential in these seeds so much that he or she will plant them in the fertile soil of the local church where they will be given nutrition and water and light so that they can step into all the fulfillments of everything God has placed inside of them. And there's no greater joy in my life than to see seemingly insignificant young people step out into the supernatural life of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And I need to tell you the story about these four girls as one example. Now, these are four very classical Swedish girls. And, uh, and these four girls, we encourage them to, to start praying for their school. Because back home in Sweden, you see... There's no chance for nothing Christian to happen in the school system whatsoever. We're a highly secularized nation, and there's no way that the church or any Christian organization could come into a school or, and do anything. So our approach, our vision to bring the gospel and the presence of God inside the schools is to simply believe in the young people themselves. Because yeah. they're in there anyway, right? right? The missionaries are already in place. It's illegal for these missionaries to leave the mission field. So we just start to surround them with an atmosphere of faith saying, you can do it. You can make a difference. Even though you're 13 years old, you can pray and you can pray to start a revival. You can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with your friends. So these four girls, the only four Christian girls in this school, they took us at our word and they started praying every single week. And their main prayer was that God would make a miracle that would shake the entire school. Yeah. 
That was their faith goal. A miracle that would shake the entire school. So they prayed for weeks and weeks. And then uh, one certain day, the school day was over, and, and everybody was packing together the, their things. And the girl to the right there, her name is Ida. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that's her name. N too soon, maybe. Oh, never mind. That's actually her name, so I can't really call her anything else, even when speaking in Louisiana. So Ida was packing up her stuff, and then, uh, you know, just planning to go home, and then all of a sudden this guy comes up to her, and he says, hey, you're one of those Christians, aren't you? And she says, yes. And she says, okay. Are you one of those Christians who believes that God can heal sick people? And Ida started panicking because she realized where this was, go where this was going. So she said, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, he said. Now I've had a migraine headache throughout the day. And now you're going to pray for me. And we're going to see if this thing works or not. <laughs> Ida is 13 years old. She desperately looks around to find a youth pastor. There is none around. There was not even a guy playing softly on the keyboards in the background. She's absolutely alone. So in desperation, she just grabs his hands and prays a panic prayer. Lord, please heal him in Jesus' name. Amen. And when he says, she says, amen, the guy goes like this. And then he says, how did you do that? And she said, did what? He said, when you said amen, the migraine headache went away. It completely left. And of course, Ida grew like two feet. <laughs> she wanted want, want to do it again? Another prayer, maybe? The next day, this guy became the best evangelist the school has ever had. He told everybody and their grandmother that in this school, there are four girls, and when they pray, stuff happens. <laughs> Healing lines formed in this secularized Swedish school. Everybody wanted to be prayed for. And that second day, God did at least three documented miracles. One guy had a torn knee, he was limping. After prayer, he could walk perfectly. One girl could remove her glasses and had her eyesight perfectly restored. And one guy asked for prayer because he was allergic to fruit and nuts. And then he ran to the cafeteria and ate fruit and nuts to check it out. They didn't encourage this, he just did it. And it turned out he was perfectly healed. Out of this, it, this school was hit by a revival that led to about 50 young people giving their hearts to Jesus Christ in this school alone. Not by the work of a full-time evangelist or a great pastor, but by four girls, 14, 13 years old, that was covered with an atmosphere of faith that was told by the older generation that they could be used by God and there's no younger age limit for that to happen. That is our calling, my friends, to accept that we are called to be spiritual parents and to develop eyes of faith so we can see the potential of the mustard seed that is the next generation and do whatever we can to surround them with an atmosphere of faith and encouragement so they can become everything God has called them to be. Amen? I'm, sp I'm not primarily speaking into Bethany of today right now. I'm speaking into Bethany 10 years from now. I'm speaking into Bethany 20 years from now. And when I saw all these kids run off to be kids and be tots, I thought to myself, inside those hearts are the seeds for greater things. Inside those hearts are the seeds for everything God has planned and prepared for this church and this movement in years and decades to come. But they will not come alive automatically, yet when planted. Yet when planted. I'm going to end now by just one final story. There is maybe the most beautiful story in the Bible, if you ask me, and I am the one with the mic, <laughs> about spiritual children and spiritual parents. And it's a story about Mary and Elizabeth. And uh, actually, when I read it to you, when, when I share just these final few minutes, would you mind standing up in, in the presence of God? Because I, I do believe that God is about to do something beautiful and profound inside our hearts. And He needs to do that. 
It's a beautiful story, and this might be the most beautiful picture I've ever seen. I don't know. But you know, if you know your Bible, Luke chapter 1 starts out with the angel of God visiting a young girl. She would have been 13 years old, 14 years old. She would have been like the four girls from the Swedish school that age. And the first thing that happens in the story, Luke chapter 1 verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And then God himself starts talking to this young teenage girl about the fact that her life is so much more precious and more valuable than she could ever have realized. That there was a great calling upon her life and that she will bear forth the Son of God. And then all heaven, all the universe waits for her response. Will she accept or reject this calling? And in verse 38 it says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. You know, one of my greatest blessings in life has been the fact that God has allowed me to see this moment tens of thousands of times all over the world. See the young generation come to the Lord and accept the calling of God. I've seen young hands raised. I see young eyes cry out their passion to give whatever they have and whatever they can contribute with to the church of Jesus Christ and to the kingdom of God. And there's nothing more beautiful. But then it says, then the angel left her. The big question, my friends, is what will happen when the angel leaves? When the youth conference comes to a close? When the goosebumps is not there anymore? When uh, the electricity of the presence of God that made my decision so easy is not there? But the beautiful thing is that God had not left this teenage girl alone. He had provided her with a spiritual mother called Elizabeth. Now Mary was pregnant, but no, not, knew nothing about pregnancy. God said, there is a, another woman, a spiritual mother. She's been pregnant for a longer time. She's, she's been where you are, but she's gone ahead of you. She knows what is about to come, and I want to connect the two of you. And in verse 39, at that time, it says, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. So we have the young generation, the married generation, running to connect with the spiritual parent generation, with Elizabeth. And you know what happens when the two generations connect? The Spirit of God falls upon both of them. And we realize that it's not just Mary in need of Elizabeth, but also Elizabeth in need of Mary. Whatever Elizabeth was carrying on the inside, that seed that was going to be John the Baptist was refilled and refueled with the Spirit as the generations connected. And Mary is filled with the Spirit and bursts out in this song of worship. My soul glorifies the Lord. And to me, there is no more beautiful picture of generational connection than the Mary generation and the Elizabeth generation coming together, reflecting God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, and how God pours out His blessing upon both of them. And before we close today, I just want to do a special thing, if I may. Can I ask all of you who are 25 years old or younger, 25 or younger, in my eyes you will be the married generation. Would you please just leave your seat and come to the front for a few more minutes? And let's give them an applause when they come. Let's honor them. Just come and stand here up front. Today you represent the married generation of Bethany. And God just wants to remind you that He's planned great things for you. He's planted beautiful seeds inside of your hearts. And I know that I can see it in your eyes that you are ready and willing to respond to whatever He wants you to do. And I just want to lead you in a prayer. I just want to pray for you guys. 
that whatever God has placed inside your heart, whatever mustard seed that you are carrying, that it will all come to pass in His time. Every single one of you up front, would you just open up your hearts right now? Lift up your hands, close your eyes. I just want to pray for you right now. And all of the Elizabeths out there, the spiritual parents, the fathers and the mothers, would you stretch out your hands to the Marys up front? And let's just connect spiritually. Let's just connect just like Mary and Elizabeth did. One blessing the other, but also receiving a blessing in accepting the calling to be a spiritual parent. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for the Mary generation of this church. We pray for the Mary generation of this movement. And we pray your will be done, Father. Your kingdom come. We pray for every single mustard seed that is planted inside of them. And even though the devil may have come against some of them, try to distort their lives like he did with Isaac Newton when he was young. We pray for wisdom. We pray for clarity. We pray for life. And we pray for light in Jesus' name. And Father, as we pray for the married generation, we accept our calling to be mothers and fathers, to be spiritual parents, to do whatever we can to provide the next generation with an atmosphere of faith, an atmosphere of encouragement, an atmosphere of joy, an atmosphere of, of, of peace, Father, so that they can be planted in the house of the Lord and every single one of their potentials and seeds will grow up to its full potential. This we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, let's just praise the Lord and lift up the name of Jesus. Lord Father we thank you for that generational blessing upon this church and the future of this church Lord we thank you that you are the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob we thank you that you are the God of the Mary generation and the Elizabeth generation may we never fall into the selfish and individualistic message of this world but always remember that you have placed us side by side the young ones the older ones and that we need one another for the kingdom of God to expand into everything that you have planned. This we pray in Jesus' mighty name. And the whole church said, let's give some glory to God here today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. just want to do one thing in the very last few seconds of this service. Can I have every eye closed and every head bowed, please? Because you might well be in here in this church today. And before you can enter into all the things we've been talking about, there is one even more profound decision that you need to make. And that decision is you need Jesus in your life. Maybe you had him once, but then things have happened and you slipped away and you're not really sure about your relationship with him. Um, today he is here, ready to embrace you, ready to receive you. I just feel it in my heart. He's ready. He says he's ready to close the door of your past and open the door of your future. Is ready to forgive every single one of your failures and sins, but he will never do anything that you does not allow him to do. So the big question is, will you, will you allow him to wash you? Will you allow him to forgive you? Will you allow him to close the door of your past and open the door of your future? I'm just going to ask you to do one thing in just a few seconds, to respond to his calling. And that is simply to wherever you are, just raise your hand up high. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front or do anything else. I just want to see that hand. And more than me, God wants to see that hand. 
Because that hand says, I'm ready and I'm willing to receive forgiveness and become a child of God. I'm ready and I'm willing to have my relationship with the Lord restored again. And I just want to include you in a prayer. Would you just lift your hand if that's you right now? Right now, I see hands going up all over this auditorium. Maybe you're standing here up front. Many of you guys are raising your hands right now. Just examine your heart. Nobody else than you knows if you need this. But if you do, don't waste this opportunity. There are hands going up all over the room. This is for you. This is for you. And Jesus is not pointing a finger at you. He's opening his arms ready to embrace you. And I just want to pray a prayer, and you can just pray it with me. Repeat after me the words that I pray, but make it your prayer in your heart. Everybody, let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you today for loving me and receiving me. Thank you for closing the door of my past and opening the one of my future. I need you because I have sinned, but I thank you for forgiving me restoring me, lifting me up to be your child. And from this day, Jesus is my Lord. And I will follow him and serve him and love him for the rest of my life. This is my commitment in Jesus' mighty name. And all people said, amen. Let's give all of our new brothers and sisters a big hand. Welcome into the family of God.